Hello guys and welcome to another episode of Positively Negative. Today I'm going to be looking at my Nikko Mat FTN. Now, Nikko Mats are interesting cameras. I think they're lesser known on the internet because people don't know that Nikko Mats are actually Nikons, right? You can actually see it emblazoned on the back of the camera, Nikon Japan, right? So why on earth does it say Nikko Mat on the front and not Nikon? Well, this camera was released around the time of the Nikon F and the Nikon F2. I actually think it was before the F2. And at that time, the word Nikon was synonymous with the Nikon F. If you had a Nikon, you had a Nikon F. And Nikon decided that their, their consumer grade or semi-professional grade of camera wouldn't be called Nikon. It would be called Nikko Mat. So basically, they wanted to differentiate between the professional Nikon, the Nikon F, and the amateur, everyday Nikko Mat. Okay? And they seem to follow a sort of naming convention of a lot of cameras in that day to put the word Mat on things, like Yashica Mat and... I can't think of any others right now, <laughs> but there are many. So obviously the Nikon Mat then is worse than a, Nikko, a Nikon F, right? It's, it's obviously a waste of time and money. Um, no, no, Nikon Mat is awesome. They're amazing cameras. I love mine. I absolutely love mine. Um, and I must pre preface this or preface this by saying that I've never used a Nikon F before. Okay, I've never even held a Nikon F before. But if the Nikon F is better than the Nikon Mat FTN, which I've got in my hand right now, then that is a hell of a camera because this thing is awesome. So let's talk a little bit about its features. And I think you'll see soon that it's a fully featured camera. So my model of Nikon Mat is the FTN. Okay. As far as I can tell, it was the Nikon Mat FT, then the FTN superseded that. And then there was an FT2 and then there were other models as well. Um, and each one of those brought little incremental um, improvements, um, but they, they all seem pretty good to me. I think if you do your research, you'll find that maybe one model is more favored than others for reliability or whatever, but I can't speak to those. I've only got the FTN, and my one is, is awesome. They also came in black finishes and silver finishes. Obviously, my one's got a silver finish. So, in terms of features, we have shutter speeds ranging from bulb to one one thousandth of a second, so that's your standard shutter speed ranges from that time. Um, in fact, that was quite high. A lot of cameras maxed out at one five hundredth of a second around that time. Uh, the strange thing about this camera, though, is that the shutter speed isn't selected by a dial on the top of the camera, but rather a ring around the base of the lens, which you click um, to find your shutter speed. Now, that's more like the Olympus OM series of cameras. So it's a strange one. I'm not 100% sure why this was decided. Maybe it was to differentiate the Nikon Mat series from the Nikon uh, F series. Or maybe it was a slightly more economical way of doing it. But um, it took me all of three seconds to get used to. And actually, I think it's a pretty cool uh, way of changing the shutter speed. Because your finger finds, finds this knob very easily while the camera is to your eye. So it works well. Apertures are obviously selected at the base of the lens. And now the interesting thing about these lenses that were made for the Nikon cameras around this time is that they have these little bunny ears um, metal bits at the top of the lens and basically that thing is what allows the lens to communicate with the light meter in the camera so when you take off a lens or put on a new lens on one of these Nikon Mat FTNs there's a little bit of a rigmarole that you have to follow a little bit of a routine so if I'm removing this lens let's just remove my 35 millimeter lens now Okay, it's removed, it's like a bayonet fitting. I have to make sure that the lens I'm putting on the camera is set to f5.6, okay? That this little um, metal protrusion sticking out here is pushed down as far as it can go. And then I line up the bunny ears of the lens with that little, uh, shall we call it, uh, stalk sticking out there and twist it on. And then what I have to do is I have to calibrate the light meter. So I have to turn the lens all the way to its widest open aperture, in this case f2.8. And then I have to turn it all the way to close it down again, all the way to f16. And now I've told the light meter what lens is on this camera or what apertures are available on this camera. If you actually think about it, it's the days before electronic couplings and stuff. And it sort of makes sense. You're sort of telling the camera, you know, it goes from this aperture to this aperture. And if... That's why it's important that you start on f5.6 because it then knows, okay, you know, two clicks to, to, to the right means it's f2.8 and three clicks to the left means it's f16 or whatever. So it's quite a clever little system, isn't it? 
the light meter itself, um, the ISO is set at the bottom of the lens and it goes from ISO 12 to 1600 that you slide a little slider here at the bottom to set, um, to set that value. Of course it says ASA at the bottom, ISO, ASA is the same thing. The light meter itself is your sort of standard matchstick needle light metering system that shows you if you're under or overexposed, uh, just like in a Pentax K1000, that sort of system. And um, my um, uh, meter seems to be accurate, my meter seems to work perfectly. I've never shot slide film in this camera, of course I've only shot negative film, so I can't say with all certainty that it's like 100% accurate, but for my uses I found my exposures to be perfect, even just using the built-in light meter, so that's awesome. There's a little... Um, a little uh, slit here on the side next to the camera which you can see what uh, your light meter is recognizing your lens at so that will there's a little 1.2 a 2.8 and a 5.6 and a little red dot um, in that little slit and that red dot should line up with the widest aperture available on your lens then you know that your uh, light meter has been calibrated correctly additional features this camera has a uh, depth of field preview that's here at the top next to the shutter release button, which is great. I mean, that's a nice feature. It also has a mirror lockup feature, um, which you slide here next to the lens. If I slide that down, the mirror is locked up. And if I slide back up again, it snaps back down. That works perfectly still. Now, the reason they did that was I believe certain lenses um, at that time the back of the lens protruded too far back into the camera and so you actually have to move the mirror out the way to use those lenses. So that's a great feature if you have one of those lenses. I don't have any in my collection, but, uh, but that's good to know that it's got a mirror lockup feature. And perhaps if you want to do landscapes and you want to limit the amount of camera shake, you could uh, use that mirror lockup feature, although I've never noticed it to be a problem before. It's a manual winding camera with a thumb uh, winder over here. It's an all metal winder and it's got an outstanding feel and a very um, solid and, and, and smooth and just very pleasant uh, feel and good sound to listen to this. Oh, it's lovely and it feels so nice. It's probably the nicest feeling uh, winder I have, even nicer than my Pentaxes. Oh, that's lovely. If you don't return the winder all the way till the the, the, the all the way onto the body, the um, light meter stays on. So if I turn this uh, camera towards you and I pull this winder here, the light meter is now active and if I push it back, it's now off. All right. So that's important to remember if you don't want to drain your batteries, is make sure that after you've wound, because it defaults to on. So if I wind on, it defaults to light meter on and then close it. Right. Just a, a little trick to preserve your batteries. Okay. You also have a self timer on the front down here, which you can wind on. Which is cool. I can't say I, I, I ever really use a, a self timer, but if you don't have a, a cable release handy and you're doing, uh, say, long exposures or, you know, landscapes, it's quite cool to have one that just stops camera shake. So how do you load film into a Nikkor mat? Well, um, unlike slightly newer SLRs like my Pentax K1000, you don't pull the, we the rewind lever up. You there's actually a little latch here on the side of the camera which you push down and then the door opens. Okay, That's like my Pentax SV. So I think the older cameras it seems had that system, right? Um, then it's a standard system of pulling your, your film across the leader, slotting it into that slot, making sure it's tight and closing the door. and uh, winding on twice and then you're good to go there's lots of videos on the internet showing you how to load cameras it's the same system here nothing complicated one of my absolute favorite parts of this camera is just the quality and the style of all the details of the lettering on the back as well as the the frame counter window and the light meter window I mean, interestingly, this camera's got a light meter within the viewfinder, the, the needle, but it also has one at the top of the camera body itself, which I've never seen before. So you can see it, even if you're holding your camera down, uh, um, not to your eye, you can see uh, your light meter reading. I just think that the fonts and the things that Nikon was using at that time are some of the most stylish I've ever seen. That word Nikon at the back is probably the prettiest font I've ever seen and I love it. I think it's just so stylish and so cool. I also love the round eyepiece at the back. I love the way these 
this line over here sort of juts down to the bottom. It's just a small detail that makes it so much more stylish and, and just as if, you know, it just shows that they put thought into the look of it as well. You know, this is supposed to be a budget camera, but it doesn't feel like a budget camera. It feels so solid. It's heavy and it's big. Like it's a lot bigger than my Pentaxes. I'm sure it's a lot bigger than the Olympus cameras as well. Probably a lot bigger than the Minolta's as well. It's a big, big camera. You, I, th I feel like you could probably, you could probably uh, defend yourself in an emergency with this guy or hammer in a nail with it or something, which is really quite cool. So what doesn't it have? Why is this one so much cheaper than a Nikon F even today? Well, it doesn't have uh, removable prisms. So the Nikon F obviously has the option to switch out the prism finders to give you different focusing aids, metered prisms, unmetered prisms, all of those things. The stock standard Nikon F doesn't have a light meter in it. <laughs> that's interesting. So the Nikon mats actually got one up on the, on the Nikon F and that's because at the time, professionals didn't want built-in light meters. You weren't a professional if you had a built-in light meter. That was for amateurs, right? Well, this one's got one. Also, it can't take a motor drive. With the Nikon F, had a removable back where you could you could use a motor drive, and obviously professional press photographers and stuff uh, wanted motor drives. And that's really it. Um, it's a fully featured camera. I was reading online that many photographers had a Nikon F and then a, a Nikon Mat as a sort of second camera, as a backup camera, or a camera with a different lens on. You know, so. They really are up to the task. They're very reliable, very well made. And my one's electronics are still working perfectly. The light meter I still find to be very accurate. But even if the light meter didn't work, the camera will still fire without it, right? Everything else is manual and spring loaded and stuff. So the shutter is, it's a mechanical shutter, not an electric shutter. So even if you can't find a battery for the light meter, or even if your light meter is not functional, the camera will still take pictures. So you just need the external light meter app or the Sunny 16 rule or anything like that. So, I mean, perfect, right? So why did I get one? Well, two reasons. First, I got gifted a whole bunch of these uh, early Nikon lenses with the bunny ears um, attachments. Let me just show you some. My favorite of them being probably this uh, 20 millimeter ultra wide lens. It's so cool. Wait, let me just show you. It's got this metal um, lens cap which unscrews which you unscrew like so. And uh, just look at that, what a stunning, stunningly cool thing that is. And it gives uh, awesome images. Um, so I wanted a camera that could take take that lens. I also have the um, the uh, 50, mil uh, 50 millimeter f1.4 um, sort of standard prime lens. It's a great lens, it's so cool. f1.4 is so fast. It's a bit soft at f1.4, but who cares? I mean, it's it's part of the look and uh, also just in perfect condition. And and yeah, these lenses are great and they go for a little bit of money, right? So I was lucky to be gifted gifted a few of them. And uh, so I needed a, a camera body that could take them. So my first thought was obviously Nikon F, right? Those lenses came out at that time. I need a Nikon F. Then I looked at the prices of what Nikon Fs go for in South Africa. Um, on the internet they're plentiful like you can find tons of Nikon F's and uh, oh, it's a cool camera and I really want one but for a good body just the body you're looking at about four to five thousand Rand right which is um, let's say 250 to 300 dollars okay now I don't doubt that they're worth that um, I don't doubt that they're worth that at all but that's just a bit beyond what I sort of tend to pay for my cameras um, I mean, my Mamiya Flex medium format camera was 1,800 Rand. So it's like half that price for a twin lens reflex medium format camera. So for me, 4,500 Rand was just a bit too much for a body. And then I did some research and I came across these Nikon Mad FTNs and FTs and stuff. And I saw a body for sale for 600 Rand on the internet. And I was convinced. I thought, oh, something must be wrong with it. It must be a non-functioning camera. Called up the seller, had a long conversation. Perfect condition. Perfect condition. The seller just explained to me that nobody wanted these cameras. They all want Nikon Fs. So I got me an, an FTN. And I see now I saw another one for sale, pristine condition one from the same seller for 750 Rand. Is this camera one tenth of as good as a Nikon F? No ways. It's almost as good as one. Um, it takes the same lenses, so the pictures are going to look the same at the end. Um, and again, I will reiterate, I've never held a Nikon F in my hands, and I'm sure they feel amazing. I'm sure the, the, the level of work is just incredible. 
but uh, but the Nikomat FTN is the most well-built 35 millimeter SLR camera I've ever held, um, and so it's definitely worth the money that they ask for it. All right, it's at this point that I just want to show you a few pictures that I've taken with the camera and with this amazing Nikon glass that I've got. Um, I've got lenses ranging from 20 millimeters to 135 millimeters, and I'll chuck a, a whole bunch of photographs, um, black and white and color. And uh, just to show you what these lenses are capable of, um, in immensely talented hands such as mine. <laughs> guys well that pretty much sums up my feelings towards the Nikomat FTN um, my two go-to 35 millimeter cameras are my Pentax SV and my Nikomat FTN right and that's because I love the Super Takuma lenses that I put on my SV and I love the lenses that I have for my Nikon and honestly I think the Nikomat FTN is probably the best deal in in second-hand camera photography at the moment I mean at least in South Africa, I'm not sure what the, the prices go, are, are overseas, um, but here they're a complete bargain because I think the secret is still not out that they are actually Nikon F bodies uh, with a few features uh, taken away. So if you find one in a good condition, whether it's an FT or an FTN or an FT2, there's, there's many different models and whether it's a black one or whether it's a silver one, if you find one in a good condition for a good price and you're looking to get into the Nikon F sort of system, then snap it up immediately. These things are awesome. I remember the first time I held mine when I opened the parcel from, from my delivery and I held it in my hands, I was, I was hooked. I was like, holy w expletive. This is a proper camera, and I still believe that. So go out and find one, and uh, you won't be disappointed, even if you really are lusting after Nikon F, as I still am. All right, guys, thank you. That about sums up this video. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time.